What's up, everyone, and welcome to the Beauty for Ashes podcast. I'm your host, Destiny Ireland, and I welcome you to the very first episode of the Beauty for Ashes podcast, which is starting off with the book of Matthew. Now, this isn't the story of just any ordinary man named Matthew. This is a very special Matthew. This is my daddy. And as much as I want to take credit for this idea, this was definitely his idea because he's no longer with us. But before he passed away, this was a story that he wanted to tell from his perspective. But unfortunately, he was really sick and he never got to tell us his story from his own mouth. But this is my way of honoring his dying wish by telling his life story from my perspective, but not just mine from those who were closest to him. So over the course of the next few episodes, you're going to hear from some of his favorite people. Through these interviews, I hope to be able to paint a clear picture of who my father was during his life and the legacy that he leaves behind in his death. Now, when thinking about where to start this story, I have to think about what was most important to my father. And that was definitely his family, but the close second was absolutely his barbershop. Now, his barbershop was located in a very specific place and it thrived because it was in that place. And so I think a really good place to start is the origin. And that's where he was born and that's where he lived his life. And that's the Brass City. In the late 1800s and into the early 1900s, like around the time leading up to World War II, Waterbury was actually a pretty big deal. And that's because of its factories. The manufacturing in Waterbury was so successful that it was actually an economic center specifically for the American brass industry. Now, there were three main factories, Scoville Manufacturing, American Brass, and Chase Brass and Copper. And they were known as the big three of brass production in the region. Now, in those days, brass was a pretty big deal because it was in pretty much everything in American households, but just in society at large. But specifically in the households, brass was especially useful because it's actually an alloy. And basically what that means is you get it when you combine two different elements or metals. In this case, it's copper and zinc. When you put those together and you heat it up, you can pretty much bend it to form any sort of shape so it was kind of like the plastic before plastic if that makes sense so anyway these factories were making a lot of brass and making a lot of people happy and that's how waterbury became known as the brass city so after world war ii things started shifting as newer products like plastic began to come on the scene and replace brass in most of those household products. So brass was kind of becoming more and more unnecessary. So this, along with the rise of other nationwide type of businesses, like places like Walmart, for example, led to the decline of the demand for brass and the decline of Waterbury's economic powerhouses. So by the 1960s and 70s, there was an entire generation of people in Waterbury, but in Connecticut at large, growing up thinking that they would be able to make a living as factory workers in these major manufacturing powerhouses, only to be laid off repeatedly as successive factories closed in Waterbury. By March 6, 1985, the last remaining employees of these factories were laid off and the last factory was officially closed. Feeling frustrated and uncertain about the future, many of the people in the city wondered, where do we go from here? This was the cultural and economic backdrop for my father's early life. Let's talk about it. Matthew Timothy Jones Sr. was born in Waterbury, Connecticut on April 29, 1967. He was the last born son to Charles and Elise Jones. He had three older brothers, Mark, the eldest, and a set of twins called David and Daniel. Along with his brothers, he had several cousins who also grew up with him. They included Neapolis, also known as Pebbles, Ronnie, and Joseph. 
The family lived in a small blue ranch out home in a working class community. Their father, Charles, worked as a mail carrier and their mother, Elise, was a nurse who worked at St. Mary's Hospital. Here's his brother, Daniel, describing their upbringing. We didn't have that like parental supervision. We were Pebbles first, then Mark, because the parents were gone. <laughs> so that's how we pretty much grew up. You know, we were the, um, not the first or the last of the, cat, the, the, the latchkey kids, but we didn't have that type of parenting. Only we have one rule, be home when the light comes on. But that was our childhood. That's, that's probably why, because we were always out from the morning till at night. So that's, there was no like parental, anything like that. There were no cell phones, there were no pagers. If somebody wasn't home to answer the phone, the phone didn't get answered. Wow. That pretty much was that we watched each other. That's now, I know I said that this story was about a man named Matthew, and that's definitely my dad's name. I promise that's his name. But he almost never went by Matthew. In fact, most people know him as Tiny. Now, there's actually a cool story that his brothers tell on how he came to be called Tiny. The name goes back to when we were probably five or six or seven, when we had to walk from Birch Street all the way to Brooklyn to my aunt's house. So Walter and um, Henry and all of them could watch us every day until she got out of work. So all, every day during the summer, we they come get us and then we walk all the way to Brooklyn. So Henry and all of them, you know, kept calling them Tiny Tim because during that era, Tiny Tim was playing the ukulele. Yeah. <laughs> so Tiny Tim and then it just we just started calling them Tiny because we couldn't keep calling them Tiny Tim because Tiny Tim was a little wacko. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we a song called Tiptoe Through the yeah. Tulips. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Just in case you are somewhere around my age and had no clue what they're talking about, I'm going to give you a little backstory. First, I have to say that I have lived my entire life all 32 years, believing that the reason my dad was called Tiny was because he was the youngest boy in his family and his middle name was Timothy. I knew that it started off as Tiny Tim as a child and then it kind of morphed into Tiny as he got older and he dropped the Tim so that he sounded a little cooler. And I assumed that this was taken from the character in A Christmas Carol, the little boy named Tiny Tim. Well, not only was I wrong, but I was very wrong. It wasn't until I was interviewing my uncles when I realized that they were talking about a very different Tiny Tim. Their Tiny Tim was a strange musician who sort of fell from obscurity in the 1960s. He became famous for basically just one song, and that song was called Tiptoe Through the Tulips. So I wasn't sure about licensing for the song, so I'm not going to play it on the podcast. But I encourage you, if you don't know what I'm talking about, to go and check it out on your own. This guy was quite the act. He would walk on the stage with someone who I could only describe as his handler. And his handler would assist him in pulling out his ukulele out of a case. And then he would awkwardly accept the instrument with like weird finger movements and weird facial expressions, and then begin singing this song in an eerie falsetto, like higher than a woman, like freaky sounding falsetto. Now, despite the creepy alarm bells going off, the audience ate it up. The entire act, in my opinion, was somewhat of a freak show. And as I was looking into it, I just kept picking my jaw up off the floor because I just couldn't believe that my dad had gone his entire life with this name. I'm like, really, dad, this is the name that stuck? Now, luckily, he definitely made a different name for himself, despite sharing his origins with a very creepy guest. His brothers talked about how 
even from a very young age, it was clear that he wasn't an ordinary boy. Here they are discussing his unique personality. Uh, my name is Mark, and uh, I am Tiny's oldest brother. Um, I've known him since he was born. <laughs> it's like, I think all of us can say that, actually. And, uh, uh, just I remember, I don't know if it was, uh, I think it was mom who always called him a little old man. Yes. Even when he was little. Yes. You know, because he always, he always seemed that he had an, an old spirit, an old soul. If you want to put it that way. And uh, he always had his mind uh, made up to what he wanted to do all the time. You know, he was always very determined. I'm David. And I'm Daniel. Okay. I has always been a little old man. I don't <laughs> care from nine years old to, to his teens till him passing. Tiny has always been an old man. I don't know where he's got it from, but he's always, he's like his father and in and, and a way, so I could put it that way. He's like his father, but he's always been headstrong, especially being the youngest. Tiny was a little nosy son. <laughs> Tiny got older because he was sitting there listening to all the old folks' conversations. Yeah. yeah. And he'll sit, listen all the way through, get some semblance of understanding. And then try to redirect it and tell it to us, but all he did was soak in all that old knowledge, and then just that started his his tutelage of becoming who he was. That and we fought every day. It didn't seem like we couldn't get along, so every day we had to have a fight for some reason. <laughs> Tiny wasn't scared of nobody. Yeah. It ain't matter how big you were. He had a dear devil. Tiny would down. fight you, or he would want to fight you. And that's how he was. He would talk to everyone. Come but the trees outside. He, I've never seen anyone really try Tiny. I mean, I've seen people argue with Tiny. But no one got to that extent that they really wanted to do anything about it. They left mad, but then they come back and apologize. But... That's because Tiny told them the truth, the truth they didn't like. His family agreed that he definitely had an old soul that was apparent from when he was really young. It was really obvious that he had a strong identity from the very beginning. He knew who he was and he knew who he wanted to be. Now, we all know that my dad was a master barber and he became well known in the city because of his barbering skills. But there's so many other parts of him that really stem from this strong identity. And so his family talks about many of the different skills that he had that he was also very good at. So they talk about him being an artist and that definitely carried over into his career. But he was also a musician. He loved music, especially hip hop music, but he loved producing all sorts of music. And he was also really good at pool. And so in the next few minutes, you're going to hear his brothers talking about all of the different skill sets that he had. Sometimes it was frustrating because he was so good at most things. Daniel shares a story about when they were young and learning how to play pool at the pool house. Everybody shot pool. Your grandfather could shoot pool. Your grandmother, she could shoot. Everyone shot pool. But with us, since... Our father was like a traveling pool shark. Well, at least that's the stories we were told. We shot pool everywhere. And like I said, we were young boys and we were shooting against grown men and we were beating them. And Tiny to this day is the only player that I hate to play. He's the only one because he gives me the hardest time to shoot. Always, even at down at the barber shop. Always, no. I hate to shoot tiny. I I still hate to shoot tiny. <laughs> That's the hardest game, and I can shoot. I mean, I shoot tiny can shoot just as good. So when any time we shot together, we both were miserable <laughs> because neither one of us left the other a shot. But yeah, tiny was uh, like I said, we were young boys. And in a grown man's era, shooting with grown men. And Tiny was one of the best. 
I have to be honest about that. He was one of the best players to shoot on Walnut Street, to shoot in Waterbury. He's one of the best. Do you feel like it's his, like the precision or the the patience? Like, what do you think it is that make? Is it just that he's just? I don't know how to play pool. Can you tell? I don't actually know, but I'm thinking like of his character. So is it because he's just really good with his hands? <laughs> like, what is it? He's, Tiny's got patience for days. Remember, he coached football too. All those knuckleheads. Tiny had patience. That's one thing. He had patience. It, it took a lot to get him pissed off, but he had patience for days. Patience. This is a core character trait of my father. The entire rest of the time that you're listening to this podcast, you're going to hear that word pop up over and over again. And I'm not talking about in this episode, I'm talking about in all of the future episodes, because this is a core of who he is as a person. And having the level of patience that he had made him really good at everything that he wanted to do. This included being really good at pool, as Daniel just talked about, but it also involved all the other areas of his life. And my first memory of my dad's patience actually was when he was drawing something. One day my dad was just kind of fooling around with a pencil and paper and I liked what he was drawing. And now as an adult, I realized he was doing some graffiti and we'll talk about that a little bit later. But I thought it was really interesting what he was doing and I asked him to draw me. Just a disclaimer, I was like three or four years old and I had never seen myself before. I was not tall enough to look in a mirror and maybe if I did, I didn't pay too much attention to it. And so I had no idea what I looked like. So my dad sat me down and it seemed like it took all day. Maybe it was a few hours, but again, I was a three or four year old. So it was a long time and he patiently drew on this paper and he erased when he needed to erase. He examined my face very carefully. He had me turn certain ways. He had me do different facial expressions. And after what seemed like an eternity, he finally turned the page over and showed me what I looked like. And I'm going to be honest, I was three or four years old, so I didn't know whether it was accurate or not. As I said before, I've never seen myself. But when he showed my mom, she confirmed that, yeah, it definitely looked like me, like he did a great job. And I remember him being so proud to point out my dimples and my curly hair and my smile. And he told me that I was beautiful. And when I looked at the picture, the girl was really beautiful. And that was definitely a core memory for me in terms of my dad telling me that it was pretty, (laughs) but also his patience in sitting there and making sure that he made a picture that was accurate and represented who I was as his daughter. His art carried over into music as well, and he loved music. He would spend hours in our basement playing with different sounds and producing different beats. And his brothers talk about how his love for music goes way, 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 way back to DJ Freeze. Music. Music. Music, because he, Tiny was DJ, DJ Freeze. Freeze. That was his name. Break DJ dancer. Freeze, yes. A graffiti <laughs> artist. <laughs> That's this is the first time I've ever hearing that. <laughs> you have to tell For me real? more about that. that yeah, I've never heard that DJ before. Freeze. No, I've Tiny never heard that. Tiny was the first person in Waterbury with a bomber jacket with real fur around that because my mother sewed it up there for him. Tiny was DJ <laughs> Freeze. As a matter of fact, some dudes were still calling him Freeze before he passed. All right, so his family is talking about bomber jackets and DJing and graffiti. And these are all elements of hip hop culture. As we go a little something like this, hit it! (laughs) These days, hip hop is kind of synonymous with rap and like rap music but it's way bigger than that and it originated in the south bronx in an area that had a very similar economic backdrop 
to Waterbury. In elements of hip hop like DJing and rapping and graffiti and b-boying, they all served as ways for young people who were living in these kind of economically depressed environments to express themselves in an art form. And while it definitely included music like DJing and rapping, it definitely was bigger than that. It was definitely a cultural movement. And this was happening in the late 70s and 80s right around the same time that my dad was coming of age. And as an artist, he fit right into this lifestyle, but he paved his own path by creating a unique twist. This is Pebbles. Well, one of the things about Tiny and just some of the things that you guys mentioned in terms of the artist that he was, but Tiny also incorporated all of that on top of someone's head. He draw a picture with those clippers and he paid attention to detail with it. He was like the baddest, the baddest barber out there. Yeah. Because it's during the hip hop time. period, but he's giving you the cuts. And it's anybody. A child can come in, an older person can come in. And one of the things that, you know, Tiny did that a lot of barbers don't do today, or maybe they have, but or even just during the time period he was, he didn't rush in your hair. No. You went in to get a haircut, you were getting a haircut. As Peppel said, my dad found this unique way to take all of hip hop culture and put it on people's heads. And obviously that's through being a barber. And if I'm honest, there was something that kind of nagged at me after he passed. I realized that I had never asked him what made him want to be a barber. And when I posed this question to my family, they all kind of go back and forth about where it began, where he decided he wanted to become a barber. Now, there were definitely some influential people who were barbers in his life, and they do talk about them, but it almost seems as if this idea was implanted in him. He didn't really have someone who told him who he was going to be and who he should become. It was almost as if he just knew. But I do remember, you know, when uh, he decided he was going to become a barber. And I remember just that uh, uh, his determination when he was talking to mom about wanting to do that. And uh, he got himself enrolled, you know, he, you know, even though he was so young. And that, that was pretty impressive, at least to me, that, you know, at that age, uh, he had a mind to do that, went forth and did how it. Old, how old was he? 16. Did, did it just pop into his head that he wanted to be a barber or like, was he told by someone or was it your family barber? Like, why did he decide that yet that young that he wanted to do it? He he just started cutting that thing. We all were messing around, but he just start cutting hair. And it would be like June to Jack, kids around, you know, kids around the block would go to him. And then he just started, he took my mother's sewing bag, my father's clippers, and he started cutting hair in the projects. And that's how he started. And because he kept cutting and the projects and running everybody, that's when it came up, he should go to school. He had a vision and goal that he wanted to meet, and he did that, and he started from there. So from a young age, it's clear that he knew what he wanted to do, and no one really had to tell him, it just was there, and he was determined. Pretty much nothing was going to stop him from chasing his dream of becoming a master barber. But maybe there was just one thing. <laughs> Well, Tiny was never around. We didn't know from our aunts doing hair that white people get bugs in their hair called likes. <laughs> like. Tiny is having a good time, never had anything, you know, the uh, eczema he could deal with. But once he sees something crawling in someone's head, he lost it. He threw away everything his apron he's gonna quit being a barber he didn't know that that was something that happens in people's head so yeah my mother had to talk to him for a couple of days he didn't go back until um jack the, the teacher called him talked to him about it yeah then he was like oh okay but that's why they wash their hair before they cut it now yeah 
<laughs> yeah. Make sure they this watch the when, out. This is when he was in uh his in school, right? <laughs> yeah, barber school. It's, this is uh he just turned he was 15 going on 16 and yeah. He was done. I got the call. He was done. Because yeah, because he had two years of street barber <laughs> yeah. before he went to school. Yeah. Tiny was the first traveling barber. Yeah, Tiny was the so first So when he barber. learned to cut about eleven or twelve. He started going around to Pearl Lake, Lakewood, all that, and cutting people's hair. Because, you know, he wanted to try to be a, a, a bootleg barber and be able to set up. But Mr. Robertson and, and um, Hoffler said, no, get your license, then we will let you work in here. So when he got his barber license, this was before he graduated or after he graduated? Before. He started doing um, internship at um, Hoffler's, Hoffler's on, on East Farm Street. Is, was that your family barber? That's where y'all got your hair cut? Or was it just somebody else? We were going to Mr. Robinson until we... I thought we were going to Mr. Hoffler's. We went to Hoffler's After our... Robinson left. Yeah, we went to Hoffler's. Because where the Tiny's first shop was... That was Mr. Robinson. So yeah. we went there first, then we went to Hopper. Yeah. Okay. And then how long was he working in his shop before he got his own shop? Oh, probably two, three years. Yeah, two, three years. That's not long at all. That's impressive. No. No, <laughs> he was he he was went to his own shop before he even went before he even got out of school. Oh, no surprise, right? <laughs> very, <laughs> very tiny. <laughs> he had clientele because yeah. of the traveling barber. Because even though he worked with Mr. Hoffler, he was still going out cutting hair. Yeah, you know, he still did. He still did house calls. I think he did house calls even after he had a shop. Like if someone was sick, one of his customers was sick, he would go into a house. Daniel's talking about yet another quality in my father that set him apart from the other barbers in the city, but not only other barbers, other business owners. And that's because as much as he loved to cut hair and he wanted to be perfect at his craft, it was even more important to be good to people. And as we go on in this series, you'll hear this time and time again, that he actually cared about his customers and he cared about people from going on house calls all around the city to patiently crafting absolute masterpieces in his customer's hair. He was quickly cementing himself as the barber of the people in Waterbury. In the next episode, we'll hear more about how he continued to grow his business, laying the groundwork to become a true Brass City legend.